Good evening and welcome to the VET Talks, a joint project of Wikivet and the International Veterinary Student Association. First of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation to join this group of experts. In the next minutes, I will give you a presentation under the title One World, One Health. Let me introduce myself. I am Dr. George Filiusis. I am a veterinarian and I work as an assistant professor in the Laboratory of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases in the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. In this slide, you can see the outline of my presentation. I will start with the definition of One Health. What is One Health? I will go further with the ideology, the main idea of the project. I will give you some historical points of our project. I will go further with the objectives of our projects. And finally, I will end with the role of veterinary surgeon. And I would like to underline if a veterinary surgeon can help the One Health aims. So let's start with the definition. What is One Health? To my opinion, One Health is the collaborative effort of multiple disciplines working locally, nationally, and globally in order to attain optimal health for people, animals, and the environment. Actually, the, this project is a revolution, is a modern global movement in order to promote collaborative efforts between different health-related professionals, like medical doctors, veterinarians, many other scientists, chemists, biochemists, biologists, health environmental, and other related disciplines. Well, what is the main idea of the project? The One Health idea actually is an example of a paradigm shift. It is a paradigm shift in the way we think about human life, domestic animals life, and wildlife under the same environment. As we can clearly understand, it's not a single institution. But One Health is many institutions and many individuals. One Health is not about one disease or a few main list diseases. It concerns all human and animal diseases and all related ecologies. It's not owned by anyone. It belongs to all professionals. All professionals are welcome to contribute if they can help the One Health aims, of course. Well, the history of the project. Uh, actually, the history of the project has started by a, an observation of a veterinary surgeon. And that was Dr. Tracy McNamara, when in 1999, as he was working at the Bronx Zoo in New York, noted that wild crows and the zoo's exotic birds were dying in large number about a month before people in New York State were getting sick. In both birds and mammals, the cause of the disease was a virus that was lately named as West Nile virus. This virus was transmitted from bird to bird and from bird to mammals by mosquitoes bites. The disease spread in USA rapidly and until 2002, 4,100 and 56 human cases were reported, and from, from them, 284 cases were fatal. Uh, the whole disease costed in the country about $200 million. As a result of the disease, the CDC established the National Center for Zoonotic, Vector-Borne, and Enderic Diseases, now known as the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases. The second historical point on One Health Project was in 2003, and that was the outbreak of bird flu in Hong Kong, in China. As we all remember, I'm sure that we all remember that the highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 epidemic began in Hong Kong, forced the global community to recognize that 
animal health and human health care are linked. This outbreak in 2003 infected 18 people, killed six of them, and required the culling of 1.5 million of birds. Furthermore, I would like to see to present you two more historical points. The first was in 2004, and that was the Manhattan Principles uh, in uh, New York in Manhattan on September 29, 2004. Health experts from around the world met for a symposium, and they were focused on the current and potential mo movement of diseases among human, domestic animals, and wildlife. And the second point is the Hanoi Declaration in 2010, in April 2010, that took place in Hanoi, in Vietnam, in recognition of the particular global threat of H5N1, and other emerging or re-emerging zootic diseases, the Food and Agricultural Organization, the World Health Organization, and the World Organization for Animal Health agreed upon and signed the strategic framework to work more cl closely together. Well, in simple terms, this means that the three world organizations formulated a worldview which would benefit farmers, animals, and other living creatures, the world ecology, and of course, man himself. And finally, uh, the One Health Project is formulated, and now we can clearly see the main objectives of the project, which are the followings. Develop surveillance capacity in national, regional, and global level. Strengthen public and animal health capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to disease outbreaks at national, regional, and international level. Strengthen national emergency response capability including a global rapid response support capacity, promote interagency and cross-sectoral collaboration and partnership, control existing or re-emerging infectious diseases, and finally contact strategic research in order to avoid new diseases. Now I would like to see the One Health project from a more veterinary point of view and I would like to underline the role of veterinary surgeon and to see if a veterinary surgeon can help the One Health aims. To my opinion, veterinary medicine is an anthropocentric science, and this means that it can help the One Health aims. Uh, veterinary uh, medicine is standing in four parallel axes. The first axis is the prevention and treatment of food animal diseases. And this is, of course, on behalf of human life. The second axis is the prevention of zoonosis, of course, again, on behalf of human life. The third axis is the support of physical and mental health of humans with pets. And last but not least is the hygiene of food, of course, on behalf of human life. And in the next few slides, I would try to be more specific on this. Well, to my opinion, a veterinary surgeon can help the One Health aims, first of all, by using antibiotics properly. Antibiotics are naturally produced semi-synthetic or synthetic substances with bacteriostatic or bactericidal activity. They are designed to have as much selective toxicity on the bacteria as possible. And in this slide, we can see the use of antibiotics in veterinary medicine. We use antibiotics for therapeutic purpose. This means we use them in order to treat only the clinically diseased animals. We also use antibiotics for metaphylactic purpose, meaning that we treat all the animals of the herd and not only the clinically diseased. 
And now comes the improper use of antibiotics, which is for prophylactic purpose, meaning that we use the antibiotics in order to prevent and control common disease events. Finally, we use the substances uh, for sub-therapeutic purposes in order to gain weight in our food animals or like growth promoters. And as we all know, from 2006, the sub-therapeutic use of antibiotics is not allowed in all European countries. Well, the main problem of using antibiotics not properly is the production of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Usually bacteria are susceptible to many categories of antibiotics, but they can become resistant, first of all, by a mutation on the genetic material. This is not so common. And secondly, which is more common, by the adoption of antibiotic resistance genes that are transferred horizontally, usually by plasmids. In both cases, the resistant strains are minority, are rare in the whole bacterial population. But under antibiotic pressure, which is the result of the improper use of antibiotics, they are not minority anymore. They are multiplying. And now the problem starts. And the problem is not so new as we believe. In this slide, I will present you a paper of 1976 entitled Changes in the Intestinal Flora of Farm Personnel After Introduction of Tetracycline Supplemented Feed on a Farm. Within five months after chicken on a farm were fed with tetracycline supplemented feed, 31.3 of weekly fecal samples from farm workers contain more than 80% of tetracycline resistant bacteria. And these ba resistant bacteria contain transferable plasmids that encoded for multiple antibiotic resistance. In contrast, on 24 other farms that chickens were not fed with tetracycline supplemented feed, only 6.8% of weekly fecal samples from farm workers contain tetracycline resistant bacteria. In this slide, you can see another study entitled Phenotypic and Molecular Characterization of Multidrug Resistant Salmonella Enterica, Server Hadar in Greece, from 2007 to 2010. 120 strains of Salmonella enterica cerevar hadar were isolated during 2007 to 2010 and were characterized by phenotypic and molecular methods. High rates of resistance to nalidixic acid, almost 92%, which is extremely high, were observed. A rare phage type in Europe, rare in Europe, was frequently increased. And the problem is that this rare phage type was circulating through the food chain during the study period, meaning that this rare phage type was transferred from animals to humans by the food chain. This is another study that shows the problem of antibiotic resistance in our animals in the country, entitled Ciprofloxacin resistant Serichia coli, isolated from the intestinal microbiota of goats in Greece in the absence of selective pressure. Well, the presence of Ciprofloxacin resistant commensal E. coli was determined for goats in the absence of selective pressure in northern and central Greece, meaning that these animals that were sampled has never taken these antibiotics, ciprofloxacin. And we managed to isolate a lot of uh, E. coli resistant to ciprofloxacin. 
Our isolates were categorized in three groups. In the first group consisted seven isolates that were also found resistant to tetracycline. The second group consisted of 10 strains that were not resistant to any other antibiotics. And the third group consisted of two strains also resistant to sulfomethoxazole. And this is the first report of ciprofloxacin resistant E. coli isolated from goats in Greece. And these are unpublished data of one of my collaborators, Panagiotis Galatsanos, working on the dissemination of methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus from clinical healthy dogs to their owners. Uh, hopefully, we will try to publish uh, our results. Uh, as you can see in the slide, we present three different methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus isolates. Number one and number two were isolated from healthy dogs, from clinical healthy dogs, while number three was isolated from a human, from an owner. All the three isolates were analyzed by polymerase chain reaction, and the PCR products were sequenced. As a result, we find that there was a great, a high similarity among the products of dog isolates and the product of the human isolate. Probably this means that there is a dissemination of methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus from the clinical healthy dog to their owners. And in this slide, we can see a report from the United States that reports the first case of bacteria resistant to antibiotic of last resort. The antibiotic resistant factor MCR that encodes resistance to cholestine has been found in the United States for the first time in a person and separately in a stored sample taken from a slaughtered pig. Probably it is the end of the road for antibiotics unless we act urgently, says the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. We can all understand that the cost of antibiotics is increasing, while the effectiveness of them is decreasing. It seems that now is the time to find new ways in order to face emerging diseases. And the One Health project is a very good start. And this project, the veterinarians must be in the first line. Thank you very much for your attention.